tuberculosis again, I think to myself as I lick the red from my lips. It's always tuberculosis lately. It's like they're trying to antagonize me, test my limits, to see if I'll stay on program, figuratively and literally. They know I hate that taste. It's got a bitter flavor to it, and a grainy texture that borders on unpalatable. But what else am I supposed to do? A girl's gotta eat. If I go back to scrounging for scraps on the streets, the hunters will come after me again, and this time I might not escape with just a scar on my sternum. Thank goodness for newbies and their poor understanding of anatomy. The media makes us out to be these soulless monsters without a trace of humanity, totally separate from our old selves. They're wrong. I'm still me. It's just that I've changed to a diet of death. But I am me. My memories. My feelings. My hopes and dreams. I am enough. I am valid. I am a good person. At least that's what my therapist tells me. It took a while for me to accept that mantra as truth, but here I am. I can say it loudly and proudly. I am enough. I am valid. I am a good person. I thank the doctors and nurses profusely, because even though the meal was a meh on the culinary scale of one to wow, they deserve my respect. They work long and hard at a thankless job, and if I give them even a sliver of positivity in their otherwise cruddy day, I sure will. I exit the hospital through the back doors, checking left and right to make sure I'm in the clear. I leave like a thief in the night, like I've done something wrong. Staff have told me that I don't have to do that, that I can walk out the front door with my head held high. I'm following the program, so there's nothing to be ashamed of. I tell them, maybe I will one day, but I know that's a lie. I've always felt a bit dirty after I've eaten. I don't think that's ever going to change. I take off towards my den in a quick stride. I don't do dilly-dallying. Not after I've eaten. Even under the cloak of night, I feel exposed. I worry someone will, I don't know, smell my belly full of blood and mistake me for an undesirable, for a predatory vampire. The scar on my sternum prickles with phantom pains whenever another's gaze meets mine. I try to smile and look as innocent as a lamb. I make sure my ID card is visible, if a little subtle, just in case they're worried. As I turn the corner, I see legs sticking out from behind a dumpster in the alley. In the darkness, there are three pairs of glowing eyes staring me down. They're animalistic and hungry. For a moment, I think they're going to attack me like they did with whoever those legs are attached to, but when I grin a friendly smile and wave, they run away. They likely sensed my kindred humanity, or maybe they're just not used to being smiled to. Who knows? But it costs nothing to smile, so that's what I do. I make it to my den. It's an old basement with windows boarded up so densely not even a crack of sunlight can shine through. But with the proper lamps and strong bulbs, I can almost feel the sun's rays on me. I convinced the landlord to let me repaint the walls, so I've turned each into murals of perfect sunny days. There's a summer picnic at the park, a sunset on the beach, a sunrise in the mountains. Little pleasures that make my existence more bearable. I like it bright. It feels safe and normal. I walk into the kitchen and pull a bag of tea from the jar labeled After Live, with the after being hand-scrawled by yours truly with a permanent marker, sugar from one labeled laugh, and finally a bit of cream from the jar labeled love. I may not be alive, but I can still laugh and love. So those two labels remain untampered with. 
The kettle whistles, and I pour hot water into my cat mug. The handle is shaped like a fluffy tail. It makes me happy, even though it's not very practical. The ears pop up around the rim, and if you're not careful, you could poke yourself in the eyes. I do not have that problem. I never drink my tea. I hold the mug in my hands, I blow on it, and I read motivational blogs. I feel human this way, connected. And with my meal still churning in my stomach, I can almost pretend like it's the tea that's sustaining me. Oh wow, Carol from Van Life Light just announced a new line of facial moisturizer called Girl Balls. Good for her. She deserves it. There's a knock at the door. And at first, I hesitate to answer. It's late, and late night callers are usually trouble, but something about the silence behind the door compels me to open it and see what's out there. It's a man. No, it's a boy. I can smell the youth on him. He's barely 30. Probably got turned less than a decade ago, if that. He has a scowl on his face, and after a moment of shared quiet, I recognize the hungry intensity in his eyes. He was one of the ones in the alleyway earlier. Aren't you going to invite me in? He asks as though my permission is necessary. It would be if I were human, but we both know I'm not. I step aside and gesture to the couch. I sense a hint of judgment from him as he looks at it. Ikea? Really? I shrug. I was on a budget, and I liked the teal shade. It reminded me of the ocean. He steps inside and ignores my offer to sit. Instead, he crosses his arms and stares me down. He's as intimidating as a growling puppy. I can't help but wonder whether he thinks it's going to work on me. I can see him subtly inflating his chest. He's trying to make himself look big and strong, but like I said earlier, as far as vampires go, he's just a kid. I've been around for longer. I'm faster. I can do things it takes decades to master. He waits for me to say something, but I don't. Once the silence has hung for far too long, he finally speaks. You're part of that stupid government program, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> disgusting. I would argue that a snack behind the dumpster is more disgusting, but to each their own. He continues. You should join us. Us, I think. The other set of eyes in the alley. Probably more. There's likely a whole pack of them. This visit, I realize, is a recruitment call. I lift a hand to stop him. I'm not interested. I said sternly, but not unkindly. You'd rather eat handouts? You'd rather be their dog? It's degrading. Degrading, he says. No, degrading is being so hungry you're practically feral. It's feeling the tendrils of starvation crawl up your spine and burrow into your brain, turning all logical thought to jello until all that's left is the need to feed. Degrading is being so hungry you practically tear a child's head clear off, digging into their throat. What I'm doing isn't degrading. It's survival. In any case, if I was to succumb to peer pressure, I would have done so a long time ago. His words are nothing new to me. I'm enough. I'm valid. I am a good person. I recite my mantra in my head until the bad thoughts are gone and only sunshine remains. It's not as bad as it sounds, you know. You get regular meals and their terminal patients get to go peacefully and with dignity. He huffs, his upper lip lifting in a snarl more appropriate for a werewolf than a vampire. They're just using you to cut embalming costs. Join me. The gang and I, we eat the good stuff. Fresh. Nothing sick. Ever. His recruitment tactic could use some work. He comes off like a petulant child, not a night stalker. I almost feel bad for him, glamorizing, sharing a single human between his whole pack and acting like that's somehow better. He suddenly screams, What the fuck is that? 
My gaze follows his eyes. Oh, that's just my Roomba. Are those googly eyes? Yes. He hisses. Ugh, is that a bow? Why does it have a bow? Mr. Jeeves is fancy. I can see the disgust in his eyes growing by the minute. I think he's regretting coming here. But we both know if he came, it's because he's desperate. When you're not on the program, you're at risk. He's easy pickings for hunters. Probably needs a bigger pack for protection. Lookouts, muscle, that kind of thing. He unbristles, but he remains tense. He takes a few steps away from Mr. Jeeves. I can see him glancing at him from the corner of his eyes every so often. Is he afraid of it? Look, we've got a good group going. We don't need any handouts from the government. We can feed ourselves. You should join us. I scratch the back of my head and look over at him again. What about hunters? It's obvious he's never had a close call in his afterlife. But that won't last. Not if he keeps leaving bodies around town. He considers his words and then says, We're careful. We get them before they get us. Ah, youthful bravado. Mr. Jeeves continues its rounds through the living room, and the recruiter watches it nervously, dodging it whenever it comes near. I'm sorry, but I'm not leaving the program to join a bunch of young whippersnappers. I've had too many close calls. I'm not looking for trouble. <sighs> Vamps like you disgust me. He hisses angrily as he stomps to the door. I'll be back in a week. Think about it. Give me an answer then and only then. Just as he's about to walk out the door, Mr. Jeeves rolls past him and he jumps out and lets a startled yelp before leaving the scene. <laughs> so he was afraid of it after all. I go back to my sofa and hold up my cup of tea. It's lukewarm now. The program is fine, I remind myself. It's not like the blood is terrible. It tastes like leftover hamburgers. It's never going to be as good as filet mignon. I know that, but it still does the trick. I put my visitor out of my mind. I've been fed. Everything's fine. I can do this. I am enough. I am valid. I am a good person. A few days pass without a call from the hospital. It's fine. I've gone longer without a meal. But on the third day, I'm eager for the phone to ring. Thankfully, it does, and I head over, keeping to the alleyways in the familiar back door. It's tuberculosis again. I don't need to taste it to know. She's coughing up a lung, and I know she's not long for the world. She specifically asked for this. It's a kindness. When we feed, the victim feels a certain amount of peace and euphoria in their final moments. It's the most humane form of euthanasia. She doesn't open her eyes, but I greet her all the same. The doctor shows me her consent form, signed and ready. I stamp my thumbprint on the bottom of the form, and he scans my ID card to confirm the details. I think it's funny that we do this dog and pony show every time. I'm in here all the time. As I lean over the patient's body, I hear his voice in my head. It's degrading. The contempt in his tone yucks my yum a bit. I try not to let it. I want to be clear, it's not him. He didn't get the better of me. I don't care about peer pressure. It's the weeks of nothing but these damn tuberculosis patients. He's not the one who swayed me one way or another. He's one of dozens who've recited the same spiel. A new pack crops up every few decades, looking for new members. But as I stand over my meal, I can almost taste the bitter taste and grimy feeling of tuberculosis. I should sink my fangs in her. I know I should. Meanwhile, the doctor stands nearby, waiting to pronounce her dead. I'm overwhelmed by the sound of blood rushing through his veins. He smells so 
gosh darn tootin' fresh. A ribeye. No, a wagyu. He doesn't see it coming. We've been working together for most of his career, a drop in the bucket of my afterlife. There's shock on his face as I lunge for him, and I know that shock soon turns to panic as I begin to drain him. He struggles against my grasp, bucking like a bull in all directions. He's putting all his might into his attempted escape, which only makes me restrain him tighter. And then the euphoria sets in, and his panic subsides. He goes limp in my arms, and it feels like I'm alive for the first time in forever. His leg gives a final kick. I don't know if it's conscious. If he has enough presence of mind to see through the fog or the bite and try one last pathetic attempt at saving himself. It's too late either way. We're past the point of no return. Both of us. His blood is divine. It's fragrant. It's like digging your teeth into a chocolate cake or a still warm loaf of bread. I can help but let out a moan, even though I know that's not very ladylike of me. It flows through me with the thrill of a racer speeding down the track. The doctor falls to the floor with a thud, now pale and gaunt. I remain in place, licking every last droplet of blood from my lips. I'm brought back to reality by a pathetic little grunt coming from the tuberculosis patient. I feel like I'm having an out-of-body experience. It somehow feels like I both did and did not kill the doctor. But his blood's in my mouth. Some of his hair and skin in my hands and under my nails. I've messed up. I run. I hope no one sees me. The front doors are closer, and for once in my afterlife I head towards them rather than the back. Just as I'm about to reach them, I hear the alarms go off and I'm suddenly very aware that my running immediately flags me as the culprit. I try to slow down so I don't look so suspicious, so I can slip out unnoticed, but the doctor's blood has me giddy and the fear moves my legs as though their own. It's her! I recognize the voice as being one of the nurses. Steven? No. Stephanie? Something like that. I'm vaguely aware of the sound of a crossbow being strung behind me. The doors are so close, if I can just... The crossbow fires. Right through my chest from the back. The pain is searing hot, like my molecules are being torn apart. Of course, the hospital staff would understand basic anatomy. Of course, they know where the heart is. As I feel myself leaking into dust, I recite my mantra one last time. I was enough. I was valid. And because I don't feel a lick of remorse for what I'd done, maybe I wasn't such a good person after all. They called it collective meditation. A video chat meditation and wellness course for people who don't leave their house much or didn't have access to those kinds of classes locally. It was free, and I was bored, so I signed up for it and convinced my best friend Benny to do it with me. The first time was kind of weird. Not because I'd never tried meditation before, but the whole awkward weirdness of doing it in a formalized setting with other people was only made stranger when you were seeing each other over the internet instead of being in the same room. Benny was even more nervous than I was, asking me if it was optional to turn on his camera or if there was maybe a video we could watch instead. I told him no, that this class had very specific requirements. You had to be single and live by yourself, be between the ages of 20 and 50, and you have to show up virtually with sound and video at every session or you were out of this class. We were actually on video chat then, too. His house was 30 miles away, and it wasn't uncommon that we'd chat sometime during the week. When I started telling him all the rules, I could feel him overreacting before his eyes grew large. Shit, what kind of requirements are those? You have to be single and live alone? Are they going to come home invade us while we're meditating? I could hear his laughter in his voice, but he seemed nervous. Rolling my eyes, I shook my head at him. <laughs> no, it's... Nothing like that. They explain when you sign up that this course is funded by a research grant. They're trying to test different techniques of long-distance meditation together. They call it 
collective meditation. And to get reliable results, they're trying to control certain variables. I think it's just some of those. When he looked unconvinced, I gave him a small shrug. Besides, if we don't like it, we don't have to keep doing it. I was actually less sure about it after the first session. Not because of feeling awkward, but because nothing much happened. There were 20 of us in the group, and the leader, a woman that just referred to herself as Amy, had all of us go around and tell about ourselves. After that, we spent half an hour with our eyes closed, with the repeated instructions to think about yourselves, your complete selves, down to the smallest detail, the smallest molecule. Think about the cells of your hair, the color of your eyes and eyelashes, the smell and texture of your skin. Think about how your hands and face look, how your body looks to you. Let your mind be an invisible camera, capable of amazing precision roaming over every inch of you. And then, you move inside now. Imagine the wet interior darkness of your body as you see your muscles and fat, tendons and organs, veins and blood and electricity. See all of that throughout your body as you would imagine they are, and then push past that, moving deeper deeper until your eyes adjust to that inner dark where your mind and your heart and your soul reside. Move close to them and take them in with your truest sight. When that was finally over, I looked over at the laptop's clock and saw that over an hour had passed. I was surprised, but I guessed it made some kind of sense. I felt off balance and odd, like I'd just woken suddenly from a deep sleep. When we got the call with the promise to be back for the Friday session, I was already preparing my casual agreement with Benny that this wasn't for us. That was pretty awesome. We were just on the phone now, but I still had to hide the surprise in my voice. Oh, you really liked it? I could tell the excitement in his voice was genuine. Yeah, didn't you? I mean, it felt really cheesy at first, but I don't know. The longer we did it, the more I felt connected to myself, and this sounds dumb, but more at peace. Like I was a part of something bigger, too. When I didn't respond right away, he spoke up again, his voice slightly concerned. You did like it, right? Oh, <laughs> sure, yeah, it, it was cool. I kind of expected Benny to still forget or flake on the Friday session by then, but he texted me twice that morning to make sure I remember to get on. This time it was still weird, but we spent our session with the other members pairing off for five minutes at the time, talking to another member, being encouraged to be mindful of how they looked and sounded and how speaking with them made us feel. It was very uncomfortable at first, but by the end of the session I felt like I'd made new friends and even in that brief time, I felt like I'd gotten to know them better than some people I'd known for years. Over the next two months, our numbers dwindled to 16, but out of that 16, everyone had become very close. We were taught to see ourselves as connected and to learn how to see and feel things from each other's point of view. As we progressed, we started doing more actual meditation too, both singly in pairs and part of the larger group. I'm not sure when things changed, but they did. A passing from one atmosphere to another, from air to water, or... No, not water, maybe... Amniotic fluid. A world where you can breathe and everything is tied to every other thing. I thought about the group every day, and even with our increased sessions to four times a week, I think the off days would have been unbearable if I hadn't had a dim sense of them out there. All of us tied to one another as we worked and slept and waited for the next session. As for the sessions themselves, they were becoming something different as well. Amy had started preparing us for shared spaces. The idea that by all meditating on the same places or experiences simultaneously, we could exist in the same spiritual and psychic space together. A few weeks before, I would have laughed at the idea, but I wasn't laughing now. Each session filled me with this terrible, wonderful excitement. The things I would see had started taking our reality and texture the closer we got to that shared space. I could smell colors and taste the emotions of others in our group. 
I had the prescient sense of the light just around the bend, the wonder just beyond this inner space that had tracked me for so long. Just another session or two and we... Do you realize we haven't hung out in almost a month? Benny had called me out of the blue as we were leaving a session, and while I was frustrated to have my warm feeling of joy interrupted by the phone, I figured he just wanted to talk about how great the course was going. So when he started out with that question, I didn't really know what to say. Uh, huh? No, that can't be right. He sounded like he was chewing something. I hated when he chewed when he talked. No, it is. We were going to go eat lunch a couple of weeks ago, but I got food poisoning the night before. And then last week, I was going to come over for movie night, but you bailed on me in the last minute. <laughs> I did not. I just realized I needed more time to work on my actualization technique before the session the next day. Actualization techniques were what Amy called her methods of imagining a whole reality outside the physical world or your own mind and imagination. One of these shared spaces that we can all picture and believe in so powerfully and completely that our belief could make it real. It was important work. And if Benny didn't realize that, then... Uh, and that's another thing. The coursework is great and all. I mean, it's weird and kind of new agey, sure, but I do see the benefits. We're part of something special. The group is something special. Sure, yeah. And I'm not saying we're in a cult or something, but I do feel like whatever we're gaining in our connection to the group, maybe we're losing that between you and me. I opened my mouth to respond, but then thought better of it. Maybe he was right. I felt angry and defensive that he was questioning what we were a part of, but was that a good thing? Should I be so committed to something and not be willing to look at it objectively? I felt a twist of nervous fear in my stomach. But I couldn't lose it. Not now. Especially not now, when we were so close to the next stage. Hand trembling slightly against my cheek, I tried to keep my voice light. I see. Um, I see what you mean. I tell you what. Let's get through this week's sessions, and if Amy doesn't have us into something new and cool by the end of that, maybe we take a break. How does that sound? Benny paused for a while, and I could feel him pondering it, wrestling with his emotions as he weighed his options. It was funny, because in some ways I knew him so much better now, I could almost know what he was thinking before he said it. But in other ways, well, in other ways he'd become a stranger to me. So when I felt his fear and doubt and love for me coiled together, writhing like snakes in his chest, my empathy was profound, but I only felt the slightest stir of compassion. When he finally agreed to continue, I primarily felt relief. Sixteen was a good number for the group, after all. We visited our shared space together for the first time that Sunday night. I don't have the words to really describe how meaningful it was, being in that place that we all knew and loved so well that we had breathed into life with Amy's guidance. It was a sense of ownership and belonging that I'd never known in my physical life. And I know what you're probably thinking. We're all just imagining the same place, or think we are, and we're tricking ourselves into thinking there's something more going on. Because it's absurd to believe that we can create real places with our minds, or that we can truly connect with people we've never met. Touch them when they're on the other side of the country or world. All I can say is that your lack of belief is immaterial. The paucity of your vision doesn't change anything. The hands in the deepest deep don't require your faith to grasp at them, and the eyes in the highest heavens see you even if you cannot fathom them. Amy taught us those words, and at first I didn't understand them. They seemed haughty and strange and silly. And she led us into her shared space that Sunday, and I began to weep. We were all there, together. I could see and feel and touch and taste, and I was with my group, more than just friends or family. We were part of each other in a more profound way than just emotion or thought. And we were all weeping, all laughing and screaming in joy and excitement as we walked arm in arm across fields of sunflowers. 
It was on our fourth trip to the field, the following week that we first saw the other. Rosalind saw it first, and when she felt fear, we all felt fear. We all turned toward the source of the ripple, the disturbance of our tranquility, the invader in our sacred space. It looked like a man, but it was not. You need to understand that in our refined and shared experience, we'd come to perceive things differently, especially when we were in meditation, and most certainly when we were in this place. Benny had joked that being in the field must be what it feels like to be God, and while he was laughing when he said it, there was a jagged, fearful shakiness to it that I felt trembling all the way to his core like the jumping strands of a spider web. He wasn't wrong, though. We saw more together, and in this place, and looking into that thing, it looked like nothing. Not darkness or the lack of something, but like a hungry abyss, an absence, an abscess, an appetite. An appetite with flashing eyes and gnashing teeth set into a rotting hole in our beautiful world that had legs and hands and a terrible laugh as it began to run toward us all. That's when we began to scream. We'd become so lost in that world over time that our first fear response was to run away rather than pull ourselves free. It was only after Beverly was run down that Benny started yelling for us to step back, step back, which was our words for pulling ourselves away from each other and our shared dream. It didn't work. That was impossible. We could always leave when and where we wanted. We were the masters here, after all, and at the end of the day, however real this place felt, if we're honest, our bodies are still back in... Another was pulled down into the sunflowers. Tony, I think. He gave a muffled yell, and then the thing was on him. Tears of anger and fear screaming down my face. I turned away and kept running, forcing myself to focus. Just step away, step away, step away. Two more, then another three. The field went on without end, and it was just picking us off one at a time. Another hundred yards of running and crying and trying to step back and finding myself still trapped in the field. Another six were gone. That should leave four more, including myself and Amy. Always the odd woman out, always the leader and anchor of the group, but outside its number. But I hadn't seen Amy since we started running. It was possible that the thing had gotten her, but I hadn't felt her fear and pain and terror in the way I had the others as they'd gone down. I couldn't feel her at all. I let out a gasp as it got to Benny. Even after everything, the pain of losing him was worse than the others after all. I had to keep running. I had to. No. I needed to stop. Running wasn't going to work. I needed to stop, close my eyes, and force myself to really step back. My breath was ragged as I slowed to a stop. I shouldn't even really be breathing in that place if I didn't want, but that didn't stop my sides from aching as I wrapped shaking hands around myself and forced my eyes to close as I focused on stepping back. Behind me, I could feel it getting closer. I could feel the terror that Aaron felt as it reached out for her. I had to hurry. I had to hurry before it got to me. I had to step back. I opened my eyes. I was still in the field of sunflowers, and the thing that was standing before me now staring down at me as I began to scream. I went to run again, but it shoved me roughly onto the ground, laughing as it climbed on top of me, its impossible lack of form heavy and cold and ever-shifting as it straddled me and sank what must be its face close to mine. I went to beg it, to tell it I would do whatever it wanted if it could just please go when its head shot forward, something hard and rancid pressing against my lips as an icy tongue shoved its way into my mouth and snaked down my throat. For a moment I failed and gagged, knowing that I was about to die. The mantra of survival drumming in my mind and heart and soul as I felt my core begin to tear free from whatever moorings they had left. I'll do anything. 
Anything, any... I know you will. The answer ripped through me, even as the thing on top of me and the ground beneath me disappeared. I was back in my living room, laying on the floor in a rancid puddle of my own piss and shit, my coffee table and lamp broken from where I'd flailed around as my body prepared to die. When I was able, I started to crawl. That was all months ago. I knew that most of the others had come back too. What had seemed like the thing killing them had been... Well, I don't know what it was, but I could feel them alive out there. Even Benny. Only Amy and Beverly seemed untraceable if I closed my eyes and reached out. It may seem strange that we didn't talk or check on each other, but we all knew what we all knew. And even then... We knew that something was wrong. That something was wrong and had found us and joined us unless they had been a part of our group all along. I still wondered about Amy, after all, and what her role in all this had really been. For a long time, we maintained our distance from each other, and every time I thought about reaching out to someone, another person would disappear. It was like seeing a light disappear on a distant shore. My group was winking out one by one, and if we didn't do something soon, the dark would consume us all, for as we all knew, everything was connected. So it was that day I picked up the phone to call Benny. At that very moment, he knocked at my door. I should have known something was wrong before I opened it. But I was frazzled and stretched thin by worry and fear, and I could still sense bending on the other side of the door when I threw down my phone and ran to it. That familiar comfort was so powerful that I had already hugged him and invited him in before I realized my mistake. When he shut the door, I never considered trying to make a run for it. Benny was already bigger and stronger than I was, and whatever was living in him now I couldn't sense what it was exactly, but I could feel it there, in him, peering out at me like a hungry owl. He laughed as he took my arm and guided me into the living room. Sitting me down gently on the sofa, he sat in an opposite chair. It took me to this point to realize how he was dressed. A dark gray suit, sharply pressed, with a silver tie pin and black cufflinks that glittered when he moved, Benny's long-fingered hands running up my throat, I gasped out a question. What are you? The thing that looked like Benny smiled at me warmly. If I could feel some of what this is, if I couldn't hear echoes of the real Benny, still trapped in there, terrified, I might have been fooled into thinking it was actually being friendly. When it spoke, however, the coldness of its tone would have broken any such spell. Some call me Trogon, it chuckled. Hmm. Others call me the elegant Trogon. He leaned toward me with Benny's face. Do you know what that means? I started to shake my head and stopped myself. I suddenly had a memory of the summer I spent with my grandmother as a child. She lived in Arizona, and we'd spent several hot afternoons bird-watching, which amounted to me looking through an old bird book while she drove around sipping gin. But something. The elegant Trogon's a bird, isn't it? Benny's face lit up, the corners of his mouth jerking up into a broader grin that might even seem natural if you don't know him. That's exactly right. A funny little bird. Ornithologists call them secondary cavity nesters. He drew down his face into a mock look of dismay. Sounds fairly uneasy, but what it really means is that he likes to live in holes made by others. He pursed his lips. I can appreciate that. Look, I... Please, just... His eyes grew hard. Don't interrupt. I'm trying to teach you something. When it was satisfied with my shaking silence, it continued. The thing is, I'm no bird. Not an elegant trogon, not even a lark. His mouth twisted momentarily as though he'd tasted something sour. 
I need a much bigger place to live, for one thing. And for another, I... Well, I stay so hungry. The thing gave a small sigh. No. The first name, just plain old Trogon. That fits me much better, I'm afraid. It's what the Greeks used to call me. The Trogon. The Gnar. Why? Why are you telling me all this? His expression darkened. Because I'm already halfway through your little group. Because unless you want to feel my teeth from the inside in the next few months, I'd suggest you do like your little friend Amy did and recruit more people to join the party. You know, create a buffer. I forced myself to meet his eyes. What happened to Amy? He gave me a wide, gleaming shark of a smile. She's retired comfortably to Florida, of course. He paused, waggling Benny's eyebrow at me. Or I ate her anyway. How does either scenario impact the necessity for you to find more people if you don't want to become my little nesting hole down the line? I gave a trembling shrug. I, I, I guess it doesn't. No, it doesn't. With that, he stood and headed to the door. I was desperate for him to get out, but I was also just desperate. Asking him to wait, I stopped just short of calling him Benny, the name lodging in my throat as I felt my friend screaming for me from some inner chamber in that thing. When he turned back, his expression was cold, but curious. Yes? How? How do, how, how do I get people to make uh, a, a space for you? Like Amy did. It wrinkled Benny's nose like it smelled something bad. Yeah. I always thought that whole meditation, social media, whatever, was kind of lame. Who wants that nowadays? People want fucking and death. They want to be entertained. And so long as they think about me, for some of them, it'll create a connection. A little hole I can start to burrow when the time is right. But what does that look like? I was terrified of making it angry, but I might not have another chance to ask what to do. What should I try? Grimacing, it shrugged. I don't know. Be creative. Use your impending doom as motivation if you'd like. Or don't, and I'll just eat you and find someone who's smarter. It started to turn away again when it stopped, raising a finger as though testing the wind or declaring a discovery. Looking over its shoulder, it gave me a gleeful leer. I know what you can do. I felt the deepest part of me shriveling under that gaze. What? He snickered and opened the front door, calling back to me as he went out into the night. Tell a story. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to the stories tonight. I hope you enjoyed both of them. I thought they were both fun, uh, fun little monster stories. It was really fun to take on the the role of a vampire. That was, <laughs> I kind of enjoyed that. Maybe, maybe a little too much. Um, but I have a question for both stories. One, when you were growing up, were you afraid of vampires and werewolves? Or did you want to be a vampire or werewolf? I remember watching Underworld when I was a kid and also Blade when I was a kid. And I thought Blade was the coolest motherfucker out there, man. So it was really cool that he was killing vampires, but of course he's also, I think, half vampire? A daywalker or whatever they called it? So I basically wanted to be Blade. I wanted to be Wesley Snipes, maybe. <laughs> um, so, do you did you ever want to be a vampire or a werewolf? Did you ever dress up as one for Halloween? I'm sure a lot of kids did. Dracula and Wolfman and all that. Over the second story, I know my audience is much older than I am, which is kind of funny to me. So this is more for people my age, maybe people a little bit older than me, maybe in your 40s, early 30s. What's your experience with chain mail, like chain letters and all those things on the internet that was like, if you don't share this with 24 people in the next 24 hours, 
the girl from the ring is going to come out of your television or something. Like, I remember seeing things like that online all the time. And I'm just curious if any of you have had, have had any experiences like that as well. I would love, love to hear your experiences. But with all that said, let's take a deep breath, relax, and thank all the patrons and members. Thank you to Absinthe Alice, Amethyst, Amet, Bubbly Panda, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, LSG, Furious Weasel, If In Doubt Flat Out, Jennifer Dameron, Jesse Jess Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrott, Kat, Kathy Fanning, Lee Riggs, Laura, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nora, Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, PJ Masks, Ray Clegg, Sentinel, The Ongoing 24, Tiger Princess, Tish Love, Tramp, Victoria Step, and finally, the airplane going over my house right now. <laughs> I hope you guys don't hear that, but if you do, it's fine. It's the end of the video, whatever. Thank you again, everyone, for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. As always, take care of yourselves and those around you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>